as I said, we're talking about rethink covenant. Last week it was rethink repentance, and that's why we started talking about baptism and the forgiveness of sins, and today we want to go deeper as we think about the concept of covenant. Recently a group of clergy um, I gather with was discussing the spirituality and holiness of doing funerals. Although none of us like the reason, the funeral, that we get together, we have found these times of gathering over a death deeply enriching. We feel closer to the family of the loved one. We feel closer to the one who has died. And as we pass through the valley of the shadow of death together, it is a time when we feel very intently the presence of God. One of the parts of the service of death and resurrection that I spend time on and enjoy putting together is called the naming. It is this part we reflect upon um, when you reflect upon the person and who they were during their life on earth. We pronounce their whole proper name, uh, we add their nicknames, and then we add any of the roles that they played during their life. My name would appear as the Reverend Kimberly Ann Barker Brugman, child of God, Christian, wife, mother, daughter, pastor, naturalist, clown, retreat and workshop leader, and friend. And then you'd probably list, you know, educational degrees, membership in various societies, um, to explain who you are. Like I belong to the Society for Wesleyan Studies, so that would tell you that I love to study John Wesley and, and that, things like that. So you, you outline these things that tell you who this person was. And all of these things um, would name who I've been. But when all is said and done, the one name or role that matters the most is my naming as Christian. Every person on the face of the earth is born a child of God. It is not a name or role that and everyone wishes to acknowledge or to claim, but it is what they are. The Christian is different because it is a name and a role that I have chosen, you have chosen. We, follow to, we choose to follow Christ, and so we take on the name of Christian at our baptism. It says some very specific things about who we are. That name comes through a loving God and, and loving parents who chose to have me baptized when I was a baby. In that worship service, they acknowledged that God has reached out to all humanity and offered to be in covenant with us. My parents agreed to that biblical covenant in my name and encouraged me to take on that name for myself when I was old enough in a worship service we call confirmation. It just so happens that Friday and Saturday night, um, I went with our new confirmation group to Camp High Road for their confirmation retreat, and I do and invite you to pray for our confirmants. Their names will appear in the bulletin next week and every week thereafter until their confirmation. Um, Jason and Jada and Dina and Donna are all a part of our new uh, confirmation group uh, that will be confirmed on June 3rd. So we went to a retreat together that's offered by the district at Camp High Road. And uh, as an opening exercise, we created t-shirts that spoke of who we were, or who we are. We had to write our first names, so I put, you know, Pastor Kim over here, and our last names, and you're supposed to put your last name across the part, the back. Mine is Barbara Bregman, so I often abbreviate that B2. Um, it's a little quicker to write than Barbara Bregman. <laughs> Uh, and then we put our favorite colors and our favorite animals and we put our birth dates on there and you know. And then um, Saturday morning after they had taught us some other things about grace, we talked about for being grace, sanctifying grace, all this good business stuff. Um, we um, talked about baptism and we said that, you know, um, we are remade in our baptism as we take on the name Christian. And so we gathered our little group, we kind of did the train thing, each one wrote on the back of the other, you know. And we, uh, Jada, crossed off my last name and wrote Christian on there as a, rep a representation symbol of our new name that we received at our baptism. And it fit just really well into my sermon for today, so yay for confirmation. <laughs> so, that, no matter what I have done or what I will be for the rest of my life, the defining word Christian is the one that matters most to my identity. Being a mother or a pastor or a friend and all those other things are great and they form the deepest part of who I am and I love being happy those things because that's what God has called me to do and to be. But it all begins when I say, said I accept the love of grace 
the love and grace that you offer me, O oh God. I accept and choose to live in your ways and under your rule and guidance. We have discussed the concept of biblical covenant in several sermons over the last six years. It is such a prevalent topic in the Bible, it's kind of hard to ignore. It is such a, um, it, the concept is a covenant is mentioned over 286 times in the Old Testament alone. So it is an often uh, lifted up topic. Some of these covenants are between two people or two nations. Um, but the covenant we, which we want to rethink today is the covenant God has made with the people of God. A covenant to bless the earth, a covenant established centuries ago with a man named Abraham and his wife, Sarah. This covenant is totally about grace. It is a covenant that is filled with blessings, and it's universal. It's for all people, because Abraham and Sarah were blessed to be a blessing for all people, not just those of ancient days. So what is this covenant that we speak of? Well, it's not a contract. It is more than a promise or a vow. It's not merely a membership, like we belong to the PTA, or the Automobile Association of America, or Gold's Gym. We have many contracts that we make in our lives, uh, to buy a home, or make it, maybe get a loan for our car, or the Homeowners Association, or uh, in our world of Washington, D.C., we often speak of government contracts and contractors, but these are not the same thing as covenant. God is the one who is promising here. Uh, in relationship to us. So there's two parties, people and God. Um, but God is the one who is promising. And so this covenant can never be broken from God's side. It is eternal and heavenly and based on God's love, which is immeasurable and always waiting there for us. God is very faithful. Although contracts and vows and promises are often made in our lives, covenants are rare. Think of the covenants that you have made in your life. For most of us, we would say baptism and marriage are the only ones that we make. And we know that marriage cannot always be likened to this holy covenant of baptism because sometimes marriage vows are broken and marriages fail. God always keeps God's promises, and God will hold us close forever, whether we live up to our end of the covenant or not. Some of us have made spiritual covenants to become a minister of the gospel or to become affiliated in lay or professional spiritual houses of religion. And again, from God's side, these cannot be broken. But we might hear a different call or go another way or backslide, as Wesley would say, and break our side of the covenant. But let's put aside our human daily ideas of contract and membership. For this is the God of the universe, making a contract with us, human beings. And I was trying to think of images to help us get this. And I was thinking of us. If I were to go out into the woods here today, if it was warm enough, and try to make a con contact, let alone a contract or a covenant, with an ant or a ladybug or some other small insect. There's this big, huge person that they just can't get their little eyeballs around, or there are many eyeballs. <laughs> and here's this little tiny bug. How would I tell them about this contract? How would I get through to them? And God did just that um, as Jesus came, as Jesus came to tell us about God. God. Jesus came in human form to tell us all the things about God that we hadn't gotten through the years. God is so vast and so huge, we don't know. We don't know all that God is. And God tried to get through to us um, by the ladybugs, who were especially sensitive to the holy calling and tried to tell us through the kings and the judges and the prophets what God is like. But until God came in ladybug form as Jesus, we couldn't get it. God loves us so much, and God was with us through all of those prophets and judges and kings, and God will always love us. And God wants to be in our lives and lighten the darkness in which we often choose to live. But as powerful and mighty and huge as God is, and as easy it would, as it would be for God to make us comply, God won't do that. This covenant God has chosen and 
us and chosen to be in relationship with us and is always going to be there for us no matter what. But God will not make us abide by this covenant. It is our free will to choose. And if we were to rethink covenant, how would we explain it to a friend or young adult in our midst? How do we express that God loves us and God has reached out to us all the time through all those centuries and every day that we live? Whether we want God or not, not intrusively, but longingly, God reaches out for us with arms that want to embrace us but won't force us. We're always connected to God, no matter how far away we try to get from God. There's always God's love showering down upon us until we're ready to receive it. If we are rethinking the way we speak of covenant to help others know what we mean, I suppose we could think of God as our BFF, best friend forever. And we know there are ups and downs with best friends, but they are always there for us no matter what. In this situation, covenant, it is kind of like a permanent, everlasting pinky swing. In trying to come up with another new image, I kind of had this picture of the dogs in our neighborhood and their owners. We have several dogs and owners who use a retractable leash, and sometimes if you're far enough away from them, you don't even see the leash, so you just see this dog wandering around with a human being, and you don't know that they're actually connected until you get up close to them. And um, when they're connected like that, the owner can always pull it back from danger in a moment and by the switch of a button. And no matter what trouble the dog gets into, or no matter how disobedient the dog is, we always welcome them back, and so God always welcomes us back. They can run to us and hide behind us, and so we can run to God and hide behind God. Um, we always are connected. Granted, with God, it is an unlimited retractable leash, and it need never be retracted uh, if we don't want it to be. For even though God has established this covenant with us, we don't have to choose to participate. The covenant has been renewed with humanity often until Jesus came and the covenant was renewed once and for all. At this time, God graciously reached out to humanity in our time of need to help mend the broken relationship God had with the creation, through no fault of the Holy One, but because of our human failings. And God met us again, and tried to reach us again through this person of Jesus. It is a one-sided covenant, with God doing all the loving and reaching out, and we simply accepting. Human beings, being what we are, we have often needed this covenant renewed through the years. It first came to Abraham and Sarah, and then it came to Isaac, and then it came to Jacob, and then to Moses. And each time the covenant grew and was expanded, as it, it went from Abraham and Sarah and their family, and to the tribe, and then to the enslaved people, and who then became a nation under the King David. And, and it, it's mentioned several times by the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah as they prophesied of its expanding even more uh, some day when God came again. And sure enough, when Jesus came along and had that last meal with his disciples, which now we call our communion meal, he spoke in covenant language once again. And now as Jesus was baptized and asked us to be baptized in his name, so too we are baptized as a sign and claiming and renewing of our covenant. We are marked with water and the Holy Spirit and made to be Christians in that moment. At this moment, we agree to be active participants in the covenant. We claim a new identity, and we are included in this ancient tradition and holy moment. And yet, it is a new moment. Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, made a prophecy about this Jesus when his son John was born and his tongue was released. We've been reading all these scriptures <coughs> during Advent and, and uh, Christmas, and, and here, again, we want to to remember how God has been planning this all along as Zechariah and Elizabeth gave birth to John, who became John the Baptist, who was a cousin of Jesus, who baptized Jesus in the water of the Jordan. And so when Zechariah, Zechariah was struck dumb during Elizabeth's pregnancy because he did not believe. And then eight days after John was born, he was named, and they named him John. And um, at that point, Zechariah's tongue was released and he could speak and when he spoke he prophesied about the Jesus and this is what he said blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them he has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old 
that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us <coughs> to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Here, we can serve God without fear. He will aid us in being holy and righteous. God will give us knowledge to, of our salvation by the forgiveness of our sins. And by God's tender mercy, the dawn will break upon us. And the darkness will be driven out of our lives by the ever-present God, who will guide our feet into the ways of peace. What an awesome a God of love expands and expresses love to us through this covenant, through this coming in human form in Jesus, thus renaming and reclaiming us now and forever. In his article, The Biblical Covenant as the Foundation of Justice and Obligations and Rights, Daniel Elazar writes, as Puritan theologians of the 16th and 17th centuries pointed out, the whole idea of covenant is the most daring one. The omniscient and omnipotent God, creator and ruler of the universe, chooses to limit himself through a pact with his creatures, human beings, to be both to both enable and to require them to take more control over their lives and the world God created for them. In a sense, the biblical story can be read as the progressive transfer of power and responsibility in this world from God to humanity. For God is our God. We are God's people, and nothing in heaven and earth will ever change that. We're stuck with each other. God has been bold. God has put himself out there all the time. How will we respond? Will we sit here holding our covenant, but not implementing it? Not living and standing on the promises of God's goodness and love and mercy and presence being with us every day? How will we respond to God's goodness and mercy? What if we take seriously our role as people of the covenant? What if we live as a people of the covenant? How would that change the way we live tomorrow, or even this afternoon?